Just as an example of how bookmakers weren't really into golf, uh, I once have got a bet on a tournament that was finished, which was quite nice. <laughs> I had a special fee to the playoff for an American major, I think it was the US PGA Championship, and got the pictures early, earlier than on TV here. And I rang up William Hill and said, uh, are you still betting on the US PGA? It was, it was, a, it was a, sh a playoff between Tom Watson and uh, Larry Nelson. And they said, yes, we've got five to four Nelson and four to six Watson. What they didn't realize was that this playoff took place in the morning, uh, which is about midday our time. And they thought it was in the evening. <laughs> so they were betting on this thing. Even though I, uh, Nelson had sunk the winning putt, so I, I didn't want to put too many uh, feelers out for for prices, but I certainly got five fifty pounds at five to four on Larry Nelson after he'd won. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, have you ever built up any personal friendships with professional golfers? Well, I was a great friend uh, in his younger days before he became the greatest one of the great players of the world, uh, the Bernhard Langer. Bernhard Langer liked to, to, to stay with us because my wife's German and he felt that it was only, he was the only German on the European tour. And I took pity on him. I saw him trudging around Fulford Golf Course in York, pulling his own trolley, and that's something that pros don't do. <laughs> but he was very careful with his money and uh, a very serious character who were uh, very devout Christian. I had to, when he came to stay with us, I had to find the Roman Catholic Church room. I didn't know where it was. <laughs> anyway, he stayed with us a few times and brought a couple of friends to stay once, let's see if we were on the floor, because they liked Christa's cooking. So, uh, yeah, he was my uh, good friend for a while. Um, just before he, uh, he won the Dunlop Masters in 1981, I don't know. He was in the European Open was at Walton Heath then, and so uh, we kept in touch. So what have been your best successes for, from a personal point of view, gambling? Gambling or on, 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 uh, oh, on, on golf? Well, that one I mentioned before about the one, two, three at Pebble Beach. I think it was 2001. I'm trying to remember who they were. It was um, Mike Weir, Aaron Oberholzer, and somebody I've forgotten. Anyway, it was, uh, it was quite something. They were all big prices, you see. And the fourth tip was Phil Mickelson, who was the favourite, and he was the only one who didn't win. <laughs> so t tipping in golf is, is obviously a huge field, it's a very competitive market. Even a man of your skill must encounter losing runs from time to time. How did you keep the faith in your own ability? Because I always knew I was good at it. Uh, and I was, I was number one in the field of one for a long time. You've got to remember that. And all these people today didn't, weren't around. I, uh, there was very few people actually did it. Uh, probably only four or five people actually tipped on golf in, in this country. I knew I was good at it because people kept ringing up and asking what, who I thought would win. And I could have made a fortune as a private tipster, but I never wanted to be a tipster. I wanted to be a good writer. And uh, that's always been my aim, is to write well. And um, I wanted to work for a paper and let me have a few hundred thousand words, like the Racing Football Outlook, which is per perfect for me. So I tend to go on a bit. But um, tipping was always a sideline to me, producing newspapers. I mean, my 20 odd years as an executive on the sporting life, drawing pages, seeing the paper to bed and all that, was, was what I was good at. And when, then that was the end of hot metal and I didn't develop with, with technology. I wasn't so good when the internet came in and people did pic, page, pictures, sorry, no, did pages on pages, on, on screens rather. That wasn't me at all. I liked to have hard copy and in my hand and things and write headlines. I loved writing headlines. And the golf was just something that developed through... Um, doing odds for Corals. Corals wanted me to do it. I, was, I had some good successes in the paper, obviously. Anyway, the guy uh, who was running the golf, uh, who was the managing the bets in Corals, 
transferred to the tote and so he took me along with him for the tote and I did the tote for a long time. Uh, so I did quite a lot of that and said all these new firms came along and wanted someone who knew the business, keep them out of trouble. So I, did, I made an absolute fortune for a while while, while they were finding their feet. I probably was doing the same or similar prices for about six or seven different firms at one time. And I said, J just jiggle them around a bit to make it not, <laughs> less obvious. So what's the most memorable golfing event you've witnessed, not necessarily one you've bet on? Um, the Miracle at Medina, I was winning the Ryder Cup from 10-6 ten, ten down going into the final day was pretty special. Uh, the wonderful sportsmanship between Phil Mickelson and Justin Rose when Joe, Justin sank two enormous putts to beat him and the way he, he clapped uh, and uh, Mickelson's such, a, such a, a hero of mine, I have to say. He'll be sorry when he goes. But you asked me what my most successful bets were, did you? Well, just what, what most memorable not necessarily ones you bet on, this most memorable golfing event that you've seen. Well, the Ryder Cup's always a wonderful golfing event. I mean, I did 35 consecutive Opens on site, which was very interesting. Of course, my hero as the winner of five of those 35 was Tom Watson. Always bet Tom in Scotland, they used to say, and nearly came off. He won four of his five Opens in Scotland. So that was, I used to be quite, quite to, Keelan putting him up. But uh, as regards outsiders in the open, well, we had Mark O'Meara at 40 to 1, Ian Baker Finch at 50 to 1. And um, my most happiest one was Ernie Els just a few years ago because I was laughed out of, out of the uh, court with putting him up at the, once he turned 40 and stopped being a, a wonderful winner. So to tip him, I backed him at 80 to 1 three months before and uh, 50 to 1 and, on, and his SP was 40 to 1. But uh, and he won at Muirfield thanks to Adam Scott bogeying the last four holes. I don't know if you remember that. Anyway, he won and, and, uh, in 2000 and 2011, 11, it might have been. And uh, <coughs> that was the most satisfying because that was my biggest in single win, I had 80 pounds on him each way, I think, which big, very big bet for me. Steve Palmer wouldn't even count on such a bet. <laughs> but I've not, not been a big punter. I've always bet within my means, 20s, the odd 30s. My getting uh, seven to four on Shergar for the uh, 1981 Derby was, was pretty good. Uh, that, I had 180 pounds on that. That would be the biggest single bet I ever had, I think. So you, um, what, so a lot of people, younger people would be keen to develop a skill picking golf winners. What would be the best tool available in their armory now for finding those elusive winners of the big tournaments? Well, Gary, oh, Gary Player always used to say, the more I practice, the better I become. And the more you know to be ahead of the bookmakers, watch everything, watch everything and with a critical eye, not for an enjoyment eye and see exactly what's going on, see who's not shipping well, who's taking the putter from off the green because he's nervous. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's interesting to check out the way people walk and behave. I think uh, there are people that you wouldn't back because you can see they know they're not going to win, even though they're very good players. Poor old Richard Bland over here has never won in about 500 starts. And people like that, they just don't win good as they are, they get to second and or joint leader and then they back off. You could, it's a pattern. And really there's only a few people you can trust to carry the thing through. Although a lot of the young Americans now look to be absolutely fearless. I'm very impressed with one or two of them. Jason, Justin Thomas is, would, is going to be a world number one, I think. And John Rahm is absolutely nailed on to be a world number one. Uh, and it's good news to say that he's Spanish and eligible for our Ryder Cup team rather than his, uh, rather than American. So I told you about my wife and children. I've got one of those, one wife and two children, one of whom is uh, an executive on uh, 
Well, look, Turf TV, she was the editor of. I don't know what exactly her title is now, but she's moved across to... Uh, at the races, I think. They have to not work on the... I think she'll go back to the Racing UK channel in the fullness of time. She has to have six months away before to, so to qualify for her redundancy, so that's what she's done. And the other one is curing the world of cancer, but she couldn't cure me. Uh, Stephanie, she works for NICE the, at Southampton University, and she's, she's my father's uh, genes because she's a scientist and I can't, I don't know anything about science at all. And I found this wonderful wife before then in Germany called Christa Chap, Christa. Um, it was an arranged marriage in a way because I helped uh, a, a, girl, a woman in, in Chesham, which I was based in for the weekly paper, she of course, her husband was uh, his trousers down, as it were, with somebody else, and uh, tried to commit suicide. So I gave her every penny I had in my bank account, because I was very fond of her, although I was 16 years younger. Uh, every penny in my bank account, £14, which is a lot of money to save in 1960s. And, uh, she said, well, I'm going to find you a German wife. So the first one was Diana, who looked like a goddess in the pictures, saucy pictures she sent over from Germany. I was writing merrily to her, and then all of a sudden I said, she said, sorry, Jeremy, I'm going to marry somebody else. So back went my friend Renata to find another university graduate, and Krista was the first reserve. She was wonderfully funny in, in a foreign language, which commended me to her. Her letters were absolutely funny as hell. And uh, we, got, we got married in 1968. So it's our golden wedding next month, or well, in July, rather. And uh, she's been a great asset. Everyone loves Krista. Nice picture of her with Lester Pig around the corner. She was probably saying that she only backed grey horses. I mean, she's a compulsive gambler. Uh, with, with Paddy Power, uh, 10p, uh, Super 51s and things, all sorts of strange. But they sometimes come up, she won 7,500 once and a couple of 2,500 ones, much more than I've ever won in a single bet, but then she goes for exotic uh, names and anything with her grandchildren's name in it, or grey, grey, and, and sometimes it works. And uh, it's her fun, her hobby, along with her grandchildren. And she has a great, very difficult job caring for me because I can't swallow. I have, have to have my food through a peg in the stomach. I've also had a broken jaw and a dentist tried to get my mouth to grow open further than it wanted to and that's still uh, affecting me now because it was, the operation was not the best choice of things to do. And that was uh, three years ago. And still not in very good shape. Apart from that, I've got uh, bladder cancer now. That's the latest thing they've thrown at me. So not much, thing, not much in my body actually works. Well, you may, now, a lot of people may not know this, but you're also a theatre critic. Now, yeah. can you tell us a bit about that? Does that help soothe the brain between punting bouts? No, there's no connection. Uh, I, I was arts editor of the weekly paper before I came to Fleet Street to do sport. So I was always halfway between the two, two things, sport and, and cinema and theatre. So uh, when I turned 17, I knew that I was sort of not going to be working so hard. Bruce wanted to promote Steve. Um, I was lucky enough to spend some time in a cabaret club called The Crazy Cox uh, in Piccadilly, and I met the editor of a new website that was coming up called Musical Theatre Review and I said well I've done a bit of acting and I've, and I've, written, and I've edited pages and things, I've, I've reviewed films and she said will you come and write for me? Oh, I jumped at the chance. Going to get, uh, unpaid work but uh, very very um, something I'm very passionate and I get two free tickets for everything I go to so that's worth about 90 quid or something so that's my pay don't get any expenses, but I, I produce um, on 91 shows I, I wrote wrote up uh, in 1960 in 2016, 
and down to 71 last year because I was very ill last year and I never thought I'd see 2018 but here we are. So uh, I've got an outlet there to write about my passion which is musical theatre. Going to another one next week. Beautiful at Wimbledon Theatre. And do two shows a week probably. Brilliant. Well thank you very much for talking to us. Pleasure.